Thank you, Vasilis. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, on behalf of, uh, you know, the, the support team of uh, the Mars SHM uh, initiative, I would like to welcome Professor Bedu Soskere, who is giving us the honor to be our presenter today. Professor Huskere is an assistant professor at the University of uh, Houston in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, and uh, he has a joint uh, appointment, one in civil engineering and another one in uh, electrical engineering. Uh, Professor Huskere got his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign under uh, the supervision of Professor uh, Billy uh, Spencer, who probably you all know. Uh, he focused his uh, PhD work in, 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 many, in many fields. I, I remember him presenting a lot of uh, very interesting projects while we were students uh, and we used to meet regularly. Uh, but uh, the focus of his presentation, of his final presentation, was on uh, computer vision and computer vision based uh, identification techniques. And I believe that is what he has made his focus now as a professor. Uh, his research at the University of Houston uh, looked at uh, his prior experience in, in uh, this type of techniques, including uh, deep learning and machine learning approaches for uh, vision-based techniques. Uh, he has received many awards, uh, both during his PhD career and now as a professor. And uh, he is now uh, organizing the international competition of structural health monitoring uh, that is designed to encourage students to explore cutting edge uh, techniques and uh, topics in, in the field. So without further ado, I would like to give the, the floor to Professor Huskere. He will be delighting us with his uh, presentation on uh, computer vision-based techniques for uh, structural identification. Uh, welcome, Bedus. Uh, thank you, Christian, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, a quick question. Are you guys able to see my screen all right? Everything is perfect, yes. Um, okay. So uh, when I change my slide, are you, are you able to see uh, the slide thing? Indeed. Okay, uh, just, just making sure. Um, so I'm very, very happy to, to be here. Thank you, uh, uh, you know, uh, Christian, Vasilios, Navidad, and, and Eleni for, for the invitation. Um, today, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, something that I've been working on recently, um, also with members uh, of my group here at the University of Houston, and some of uh, what I've been, uh, what I worked on towards the end of my PhD. Uh, the title of my talk is Enhancing Computer Vision Based Structural Assessments with Synthetic Imagery. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So here's a, a brief outline of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to first try to give you an intro to uh, why vision-based assessments uh, are, uh, are necessary. Um, and then uh, I'm going to move on to, to motivating um, the, the, the need for synthetic imagery. So I'll talk about some of the problems with uh, you know, the current research with vision-based assessments and then use that to motivate uh, the need for synthetic imagery. Uh, and then um, I'll talk about two different uh, ways of generating synthetic imagery. Uh, one is computer-generated imagery or you know, CGI, that, uh, uh, which is an abbreviation that you may be familiar with. Um, and then uh, I'll also talk about data-driven imagery, uh, which is generating images purely based on data. Uh, and then I have, have some conclusions uh, at the end. Um, and if you, if you have any questions during uh, the presentation, you can feel free to, to put them in the chat. So um, to, to give you, uh, uh, you know, a bit of perspective, uh, the, the way that structural assessments are done uh, in the United States and indeed in most parts of the world uh, is predominantly through manual visual inspections. Uh, and this can become very challenging for um, you know, a, a lot of structures that 
uh, till you require uh, regular inspections. For example, this is the bypass bridge um, in front of the, the Hoover Dam in Nevada. And you can see uh, this engineer is rappling down uh, this column. And all he's trying to do is to inspect for signs of damage on these columns. And so you can see that uh, this is uh, quite difficult to do manually. Uh, and um, there are several cases where something like this is, is, is quite challenging. Uh, if you have a large network of structures like a system of roadways and you want to be able to you know, accurately uh, quantify different kinds of damage in this network, uh, it's, it's difficult to do this manually. Um, similarly, if you have inaccessible structures, um, it's difficult to get people there manually. So if you have a robot that can go around and collect images automatically, that uh, would be very useful. Um, there are also uh, situations where you know time is of the essence. For example, after a disaster, you want uh, to be able to uh, get people back into their uh, buildings uh, as soon as possible. And um, and usually, uh, if there's a a severe disaster that hits a densely populated region, you have a lot of damage, and you don't have enough engineers to go around and inspect these structures uh, in an efficient manner. So uh, this is um, a video of a damaged building that I took from Mexico City back in 2017, where I uh, participated in the uh, in the inspections after uh, after the earthquake, uh, and it took uh, a team of around 400. Uh, structural engineer volunteers um, several weeks to be able to uh, you know, do the inspections of the city. And as a result of that, you had a lot of people waiting out um, in encampments, uh, you know, being uncertain about uh, the safety of their, their structures. And uh, so it, it, uh, in general, it, it reduces the resilience uh, of, uh, of the community. Um, so, so what I worked on uh, for my PhD was a framework for automating these inspections, uh, and you know a, a lot of researchers have um, have looked at, um, at at a framework like this, uh, as well as the different components of such a framework. But uh, and, and there are different ways to, to slice this pie. But um, I'll, I'll give you four you know key um, tasks. That, that would be involved in, uh, in, a, in an automated inspection system. Uh, the, the first uh, would be to develop annotated data sets. Now, the backbone of, uh, of any uh, automated uh, inspection system is going to be uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. Uh, and these algorithms are going to be used to, to be able to uh, you know, process the images that are acquired. Uh, and so these could be acquired uh, by, by a robot or, or by, um, by some other mechanism. Uh, and the images have to be processed uh, to be able to um, you know, produce some, some information that can be used to make uh, decisions uh, about the structure. Uh, and the backbone for any machine learning uh, model is uh, the availability of, of data. Uh, and so uh, the, the first step sort of before the disaster occurs would be to develop annotated data sets that can take as input the kinds of images that you're providing uh, and then produce uh, you know, important data that uh, or important information that um, is required to make decisions. Uh, the, the, the second step is um, is what would happen after, uh, you know, for example, a disaster occurs, or once you know that you want to inspect the structure. Um, uh, here, we want to be able to acquire data automatically. Uh, and so the, the use of uh, robots like unmanned aerial vehicles or unmanned ground vehicles uh, with different kinds of sensors like cameras, LIDAR, or infrared uh, is going to be very really, uh, crucial to be able to actually acquire uh, the data from the structure. Uh, and um, these could um, navigate using these sensors, but also using other sensors like GPS, depending on the environment and, and the situation in which uh, the inspection is being conducted. 
And so once you have these images, you, you use uh, your deep learning models that have been trained on the annotated data sets to actually produce the information that you train these models to, to produce. So, so this is what uh, we call data processing. Uh, and you can have different deep learning models trained for different inspection subtasks. Uh, for example, if you're an inspector that, that goes out to a structure and you're trying to make an assessment, uh, you, you don't just look at the damage, you look at uh, the context in which this damage occurs. For example, you might want to see what kind of material, uh, what kind of structural material has been used and what, um, what kind of structural components uh, are actually experiencing this damage. And so you could uh, train different models, different deep learning models for these, these tasks uh, by, by annotating those tasks uh, appropriately in, in the first step that I know. So uh, you have these models that are trained and then you, you use them with the acquired imagery and you, uh, you make your predictions uh, for, um, for, for you know, these different inspection subtasks. Uh, and, and the final step is to then um, convert this to actionable information. Uh, and uh, this could be something like a damage state where, um, you know, for example, green would mean uh, safe and yellow means it needs uh, you know, more detailed inspections. And then red means uh, the damage is severe and uh, uh, perhaps the structure needs to be uh, you know, uh, cut off from, from use. Or another way, another kind of actual information would be just to put all of this information together into a model uh, to make it searchable, or perhaps just visualize the results for a human inspector to then look at and quickly be able to make, make a decision. So, so this is the, the general framework for uh, automating uh, inspections that I, uh, that I lay out. Uh, and, and indeed, different researchers have worked um, on, on, all of, on all four of these aspects um, extensively over the past uh, five years. Uh, but um, you know, there, there are still many challenges towards uh, research on autonomous inspection. And uh, in this slide, I list some of those, those challenges. Um, for example, uh, structures uh, that, that occur in our, that, that we build in our, uh, uh, you know, in our countries uh, are very diverse and numerous. And um, on the other hand, uh, damage is relatively rare. So there's so many different kinds of buildings and bridges that can actually occur, but um, uh, compared to that set uh, of infrastructure, uh, the set of structures that actually have damage uh, is, is significantly small. Uh, and so to be able to uh, get uh, you know, diverse data sets of different kinds of structures that are damaged to train your models, to train your deep learning models is, is very uh, difficult. Uh, another thing is that damage is often ephemeral. Uh, for example, if you have a disaster, then, uh, you know, the whole uh, city is working to, to recover from that. And so the, the main objective is to fix the damage as soon as possible. Uh, and so it becomes difficult to, to then uh, easily acquire images of these structures unless you you have a whole system to to go out and uh, you know you know collect images specifically for for this kind of research. Um, another big challenge is that um, supervised learning annotation uh, learning requires manual annotation, uh, and this can be quite cumbersome. Uh, for example, if you're doing something like semantic segmentation where you're trying to make a prediction for each pixel in an image, then uh, you have to um, annotate each pixel in an image in your training data set. And that's, uh, it's a very tiresome uh, job. Um, another thing is that field data collection to build these data sets uh, is, is weather dependent and it's also expensive in terms of uh, you know, time and, and other uh, resources. Uh, Additionally, it's, uh, it's nearly impossible to obtain data sets covering all variations of image properties, like, for example, camera distance, viewpoint, and lighting. So you would have to do several surveys just for a single building with a robot to be able to 
cover all of these, these different properties. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, while it's possible to you know, build specific data sets and then uh, validate, um, uh, validate your models with those data sets, it's, it's difficult to validate the entire inspection process end to end uh, using, uh, you know, by actually collecting data in the real world. Um, especially uh, in a research setting, uh, unless you're, you know, a company like uh, like Tesla, which which has all these, uh, you know, cars out in the real world, and then also the, the ability to to do the data annotation, and then also do the um, the, the data processing and, and, and all of that, um, it's it's difficult to validate this uh, any any autonomous system, including an autonomous inspection system. Uh, end to end. So, so these are you know major challenges that uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, and towards this, what we've been looking at uh, is the use of synthetic imagery um, to to try to you know address some of these challenges. So, uh, when I say synthetic imagery, uh, there are two kinds uh, of synthetic imagery that we've been looking at. Uh, one is computer generated imagery. And so this is, these are images that are generated using computer graphics. Um, and then uh, another kind of synthetic imagery is data driven imagery. Uh, and here you, you base the images that are generated purely on, um, on, on data that, that we supply to, to a new look. So I'm going to talk about both of these um, now. So, so first I'm going to talk about uh, computer generated imagery. Um, in, uh, in general, uh, there are different ways to generate imagery using computer graphics, but um, we've come up with a, um, a pipeline that you can use to, uh, to automate the process of generating damaged buildings. And uh, the first step of this pipeline is to uh, build something called a physics-based graphics model. Now, if you're trying to generate um, a damaged structure and, and you know pictures of a damaged structure so that you can use it for uh, inspection studies, um, you have to figure out you know how to damage the structure uh, and what that's going to look like. And um, you know, as structural engineers, uh, you know, we we have a lot of uh, knowledge about this. Uh, uh, you know, researchers have study, um, uh, you know, the behavior of structures, uh, you know, with the past 50 years. And so there are a lot of models available to predict the, the performance of, of structures. And so we use, uh, we, we, we leverage uh, that uh, to, to kind of uh, more realistically simulate the, the presence of damage. Um, and uh, we, we do that using a finite element model uh, with, uh, for example, if you're simulating an earthquake, then we have a nonlinear time scale analysis to, to, to figure out where uh, the damage will occur. And then we combine that with a graphics model uh, to then um, figure out what the, the what that damage would, would look like. And all of this together, um, I call the physics-based graphics model. Uh, and then uh, we put this model into uh, an environment with you know, uh, background with cameras and lighting, and then uh, you know you can render uh, images. And so this this whole environment is called a three D synthetic uh, environment. And then um, uh, finally, from the three D synthetic environment, you can do uh, you know you can simulate different flight paths for UAV. You can simulate different lighting conditions, and and so on and so forth. And uh, another big advantage is. Because the location of damage is implicitly modeled, uh, you get your annotated imagery for, for free. Uh, so, so you know uh, exactly uh, where the different kinds of damages uh, damage are. So here you see um, um, some spalling in the swall and some cracks. And then we get the annotations for the spalling and the cracks for free with, uh, this, uh, with this framework. So, so that's the um, that's the idea. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more um, about uh, each of these these steps. The first is 
the physics-based graphics model. I'm going to tell you how we actually uh, generate uh, these physics-based graphics models. Um, the first step is to start with the graphics mesh. Um, and so, so this could be something like, um, you know, an architect would build or um, it could also be generated parametrically. We just generate these uh, parametrically using some uh, simple um, uh, inputs. Uh, and um, once you have this mesh, this will serve as the basis for the graphics model. So it, it determines the geometry, the location of different structural components, uh, the location of different non-structural components, and so on. Uh, and then uh, we use the, the same geometry to create uh, a global finite element model. Uh, and that gives us uh, the global structural response of, uh, of the structure. Uh, and then we also have individual more detailed models for each of the components. Uh, and um, uh, the, those, the individual detailed models that you see here, for example, for different walls, they give us um, more information about the, the precise location of damage that might occur on those components. Now, the, the next step is to take uh, the results from this finite element analysis and then uh, produce what we call damage masks. So uh, this is this will serve as input to the graphics model and uh, will uh, delineate the location for different kinds of damage, for example, spawning and cracks and so on. So we start with, um, you know, some uh, uh, some quantities, some response quantities. For example, here I plot uh, the plastic strain of a wall that's subjected to an earthquake. Um, and then um, the constitutive model that's been used for these walls in this uh, research is the, the concrete damage plasticity model. And that has another response parameter called the damage compression index. And so that's another thing that we use for um, as uh, a damage indicator. Now, uh, we can't really model all kinds of damage. Um, and so uh, for, for the kinds of damages that you can't model, you can also have some sort of heuristics to determine where to, to you know, apply your damage. So for example, if you have corrosion, then you can, uh, and if it's uh, on a body that's uh, you know, partially submerged in water, then you know that, that there's going to be higher corrosion near where the, the body meets, the, you know, the structure meets the water. So you can, you can have uh, different heuristics that you get based on your experience and our observations um, uh, as well. And so you just have to import that um, somehow into, into your model. Um, and uh, both of these, they, they pass through um, a, uh, you know, fragility curve to determine uh, what the damage state is for each of these components. Um, and uh, th that's based on some response quantity from the global um, uh, finite element model. Uh, and we use the industry ratio. So, so from that, we get the, the probability of uh, each component being in a certain damage state. And then we use the damage state to determine the, the severity of um, the, the damage that's going to be visible using these patterns, and then we, we generate the damage masks. The, the next step is uh, to convert these damage masks to some uh, you know, photorealistic texture. Um, and um, we, we use um, you know, computer graphics models uh, to, uh, together with some uh, you know, noise-based texture generation. To, to be able to uh, get those, those texture maps. Uh, and then um, with this, we have you know, textures for each uh, component. And then we combine, um, uh, we combine that to, uh, to apply those textures to the graphics mesh. Uh, and then uh, finally, we, uh, if you do that for all the components, uh, then uh, you get uh, your, your building, and then you can put it in the scene and then uh, add your lights, the, the background, uh, set your cameras, and then you can render pictures from, from that scene. So, so that's 
that's the overall process for uh, these physics-based graphics models. Here is one uh, example of, uh, uh, of a render uh, from one of the graphics models that we created. On the right and on the left, you can see uh, a real picture of, of a similar structure. Um, you can see that the, the location of damage uh, is, uh, there's, there's some uh, similarity between the locations of damage in both of these. Um, and, um, uh, and that's because the, the, the dimensions of both of these structures are nominally the same. Uh, and um, uh, the, the, the material properties used um, you know, uh, uh, result in um, in the the damage you know being uh, around the, the same uh, effect here. Uh, we both of these structures were also su subject to uh, the same uh, peak ground acceleration. Uh, the one on the left, uh, we have some uh, information about uh, the the ground acceleration. Uh, from the vicinity and uh, we subjected this um, synthetic model also to, to, to ground acceleration with the same uh, intensity. Um, but, but anyways, all, all I'm trying to show here is that um, we can generate photorealistic renderings using this, uh, this framework. Um, and then, uh, like I said, the, the last step is that we also get these annotations for three, um, and you can get several different kinds of annotations. On the left here, I have an example image um, that's rendered from from, this, uh, from from one of these environments, uh, and then uh, here uh, there are annotations for damage state. Uh, we have um, yellow meaning that the component is moderately damaged, green meaning it's not damaged, and red meaning. Uh, it's severely damaged, and we get this directly from uh, the, the finite element model and the fertility curves. We also have other information like the components falling uh, and the cracks. And then you can also get information like the depth, uh, which is the, the distance from uh, the camera. So this is a lot of useful information that can be used for uh, inspection study. So we, we generated 11 buildings parametrically using this, this framework. Uh, and we, we took a lot of uh, pictures using simulated UAVs around uh, this, these structures. Um, and we generated something called the Quake City dataset. Uh, and this is part of the international competition on structural health monitoring uh, that um, in, in 2021. And so we have uh, you know, over 180 teams that are participating in um, building models for uh, semantic segmentation with this, with this data set. So the data set has 4,688 images and six annotations per image uh, of size 1920 by 10. And there's a lot of variety here in terms of the paint color, in terms of the layouts, in terms of the, the views, in terms of the lighting. Um, so, so really you can, because all of these are parameterized, you can potentially generate an infinite amount of data uh, you know, that, that intersects with uh, the range of parameters that, that you're able to debate. Now, so this is all well and good. You can, you can generate these bicycle pictures, but uh, the question is uh, what, uh, how can you use these pictures to actually uh, you know, do something useful? So we did a couple of experiments just to illustrate the potential of this for, for inspections. Uh, the first one is augmenting the real data with synthetic data. And the second one is comparing damage state estimation using UAV and ground based methods. Uh, I'll talk about the first one now. Um, and so these are just details of the uh, experiment that, uh, that we conducted. Um, um, we trained eight different uh, deep learning models to evaluate the potential role of synthetic data in enhancing the overall uh, performance of models on real data. And um, there were four pairs uh, of training schemes in which each scheme had one model trained only on real data and another model trained uh, on real data and synthetic data together. Um, 
And then in each pair, what, uh, what it varied was uh, the amount of real data that was used. Um, so uh, in total, uh, we had um, 150 uh, you know, high resolution uh, images that, um, that I took in Mexico City that we used, uh, that, we, that we annotated. And um, the, those 150 images were split in, um, in different ratios. So for example, 20% uh, for training and then 80% for testing. And then 40% for training, 60% for testing, um, 60 for training, 40 for testing, and 80 for training, 20 for testing. So the, those are the four schemes. Uh, and then for each of those schemes, we added synthetic data. So that gives you eight total. Uh, so the same amount of synthetic training data was used in, in all four schemes. And this resulted, um, and this included the training images from the quick city data set. So here are the results. Uh, the quantity on the y-axis is the uh, test IOU. Uh, and IOU is the area of overlap divided by the area of the union. Um, so if you have, uh, say you're predicting that this um, square on the left is uh, all spalling, and then the area on the right is the actual uh, box representing spalling then uh, your IOU is the area of overlap divided by the area of the union. So if the IOU is one, that means there's a perfect overlap between your ground group and your prediction. Um, and, and if it's anything lesser than that, then you know, it, it's, it's not perfect. But uh, it gives you a good indication of how well your network is able to localize um, what you're looking for. So here we train uh, those eight networks on identifying spalling in the real images. Um, and here are the results when uh, we had 60% of real images for training and 40% of real images for testing. On the, on the x-axis here are the number of epochs during training of the network. Uh, and you see that uh, as um, the network training uh, moves on, um, the performance of this blue line goes above the orange line. The blue line is, uh, you know, the synthetic data, the Quake City data plus 40% uh, of the real data, and then uh, the orange line is 40% of the real data. So you can see that uh, there's a difference of about 10 uh, percentage points um, once the the networks have converged. So this is a, a big difference. Uh, and it goes to show that uh, addition of synthetic data can really help improve the performance of your network on real data. Uh, and here are results from those four different networks. This is just the difference between um, the networks with and without the Quake City data. So you can see that for this um, set where you have 0 0.4 uh, fraction of uh, the real data as training, uh, it finishes at about 10. So that was the difference here between these two plots. And for other schemas as well, uh, the trend is for it to improve. And eventually, with the synthetic data, the performance um, always becomes better than what it would be uh, without the synthetic data. So here are some examples uh, you know, of images where the performance is improved with uh, synthetic data. Um, on the left is a real image. Uh, here, the second column is the ground truth, which is manually annotated. And then the third column is, um, uh, is the results with using only the real data for training. And the last column is using synthetic plus real data. And you can see that uh, just with the real data, it kind of misses some, some parts, uh, whereas with the synthetic data, it's, it, it does a much better job of localizing uh, these, uh, you know, the, these parts of the, the damage. And you know, it's similar for these other devices as well. Now, uh, another experiment that we did was to uh, compare the damage state estimation uh, using ground-based imagery and UAV-based imagery. 
So the question is given a specific train network, say you, you already trained your network uh, before uh, you know, disaster occurs, uh, but you're trying to figure out if you can use say ground-based capture for a certain, uh, certain building. Um, so, so the question they're asking is, can we compare this performance for different data acquisition strategies on, on a new structure that you know, the network hasn't seen before? So uh, a ground-based image might look something like this, and a UAV-based image might look something like this. So there's some difference here. Um, so we, uh, we did an experiment where we trained uh, three models. One is just on the Quake City data. One is on the Quake City data with 25% um, of a different building. So there were 11 buildings in the Quake City data. And so the different building I'm calling B12. Uh, and um, the, the testing data is, uh, in, in this first case, is just with the uh, ground-based imagery from B12. Um, and then it's uh, with 75% of the UAV-based imagery from B12 and 75% of the ground-based imagery uh, from B12. Uh, and uh, what the results show is that um, uh, for, for all three damage states, the uh, IOU rate um, uh, is, is very low when you just use the, the data with you know, UAV based uh, imagery in the Quake City data set um, on the new building with ground based imagery. So you can see that the IOU is really low. But then um, uh, we can also see that with the addition of, you know, 0 0.25 um, percent of images from the from from B12, and so this includes both UAV and cloud imagery, um, the the IOU drastically improves, and so you can see that uh, for for this case, even though the bulk of the images are from a UAV, the ground based network also performs nearly as well as the, the, the UAV based yeah, images. So here are some examples in, in, uh, just to illustrate what I mean. Um, here we're predicting the, the damage state. Um, and on the left is an example of an image acquired from the ground. And then below that, uh, an image acquired from a UAV. And you see that um, uh, the the ground truth damage states uh, are in the second column, and um, the the performance of the network on uh, images from ground week well is nearly as uh, as good as the performance of uh, the network on uh, images from a UAV. So there are still some some issues, but uh, the purpose of the study was to you know kind of um, determine. Uh, whether your, you know, pre-trained network would work well in a given scenario, and uh, you can also find out how much additional data you need uh, for it to, to work well for a particular building from a particular, uh, you know, uh, robot uh, data acquisition plan. So to, to summarize, um, computer-generated imagery can be used to enhance vision-based inspections. Uh, synthetic CGI data can be used to augment limited real data to achieve improved performance. And physics-based graphics models in synthetic environments are a powerful tool. And they can be used to model the inspection process from end to end and study different uh, scenarios uh, that, that may be of interest to, to asset managers. Um, so, so that uh, brings me to the end of uh, the, the first part of my, my presentation, which is about um, generating uh, images using computer graphics. Uh, the second part of my presentation is not as long as the first one. Um, so hopefully we'll still be done on time. Um, but here I talk about uh, data-driven imagery. Now, um, uh, computer-generated imagery is powerful, but it has many tunable parameters, uh, which make generating these images uh, sometimes uh, challenging. For example, you, you can have different constitutive models. You can have different uh, bi-directional reflectance distribution functions, which are basically how the light reflects off of these buildings. 
Uh, you can have different bridging dimensions, different types of damages that need to be modeled, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that actually goes behind creating these models. So another perhaps simpler approach would be to generate synthetic imagery based purely uh, on, on data. And you know, the advances in deep learning, this is, uh, this is now possible. And photorealistic images of damage can be generated using um, generative adversarial networks. Now, um, you know, quick intro to GANs or, or generative adversarial networks. Uh, GANs are deep neural networks that consist of a generator and a discriminator. So the generator um, is kind of like uh, an encoder and, um, sorry, it's, it's kind of like a decoder which takes some uh, uh, random noise as input and then um, produces an image as output. And the discriminator, um, looks at this output and then tries to determine if that image is real or fake. Um, and so GANs have been used to generate uh, synthetic images you know, for the past, um, uh, past uh, seven, eight years. And uh, research on GANs have grown significantly. Um, the way they work is that they, GANs learn, to, learn the distributions that underlie these images and they, they are able to interpolate in that distribution to generate um, you know, realistic images that, that would seem like they belong in that distribution. Uh, researchers have also found that these generated images uh, have been very, uh, are, an, are a very effective strategy for data augmentation. Uh, but uh, with the vanilla GAN implementation, uh, there is, we don't have too much control on the kinds of images that, uh, that we generate. For example, if we're trying to look, if we're trying to generate damaged images of a particular structure, then the the, with the you know the, the bare bones can we won't be able to do that. So uh, a student of mine, uh, student like this, he's been working on uh, trying to use something called a cycle consistent adversarial network for um, generating images of, of damaged structures. And here, what we're doing is an unpaired image to image translation. So so this network was proposed by Ju et al. in twenty seventeen. Uh, and uh, here are some examples that I could uh, illustrate that. Uh, the, the goal here is to uh, have two uh, unpaired data sets uh, and then uh, try to translate one, um, you know, one distribution to, to another. So for example, you could have a bunch of images of zebras and have a bunch of images of horses. And uh, what this network tries to do is to uh, look at both these um, sets of images and learn the distributions and figure out a mapping between these distributions. So it, it retains the geometric properties in one of, um, in the input uh, image, but uh, is able to change um, the properties that uh, are different in uh, the, the other uh, unpaired uh, set. So for example, here you, you still retain the shape of the, the zebras, but the color of the skin is a uh, color of the, you know, their coats are changed to, to make them look more like horses. And then you can, this, you know, this works both ways. So what we're trying to do is to do something similar, but to have an input dam uh, undamaged structure and then to generate um, a damaged structure as the output. Um, so we tried doing this just with uh, the CCAN architecture proposed by Ju et al. in 2017. Um, but uh, that, that we had some issues and that was, it was not working well. So we, we started looking at other architectures and then we also proposed uh, our own architecture, which we think uh, works well for this purpose. Um, and like I said, what we're trying to do is to, tra to translate an input of an undamaged structure to uh, a damage to representation of that same structure. Uh, the the main uh, contribution that uh, you know that uh, Subin made uh, was to incorporate something called eigencam, um, and here cam stands for class activation mapping. Um, and um, eigencams or you know class activation mappings in general, uh, they can be used to uh, you know, to, to better interpret what's happening uh, inside uh, a neural network. So deep neural networks tend to be very uh, opaque, uh, but if you have a deep neural network brain for classification, say, uh, you can then use um, uh, the, the, the layers of the train network 
to, to figure out which uh, regions of the network are contributing most to the decision making of the network. Uh, and that's what's highlighted here. For example, here uh, we have these uh, fruits uh, and um, this is being classified as a strawberry. And so you can see that um, the regions of the strawberry are the ones that are highlighted uh, the most. And these are different uh, class activation mapping uh, proposed by different researchers. And uh, specifically what EigenCAM does is that it takes the activations of you know, any convolution layer in your network, calculates its first principal component, and then uh, it projects the activation layer of the convolution layer onto the first uh, principal component. Uh, and then uh, that is uh, uh, displayed in the same size as your input image. And then you, you, you get information as to where um, the most important information in that image is, is present. So, so we uh, incorporated um, uh, this EigenCAM into, uh, into our network um, for generating images using unpaired data sets. And um, uh, this is what the network looks like. We have uh, the input uh, images that are passed uh, to uh, an, an encoder, the ResNet50, which is just trying to classify images as to whether they're damaged or not. And then here we take um, the convolution layer, pass it to EigenCAM, and then we get these fast activation mappings. And those are uh, concatenated with the image and passed through um, uh, a generator called uh, UGATIT, which is uh, proposed in 2019. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, the, the um, UGATIT generator has uh, you know, a typical CCAN. Uh, architecture with an encoder, decoder, as well as SQL blocks. Uh, and then uh, eventually we get a translated image, which are uh, pictures of, of the damaged structure. So here are some, some examples uh, comparing um, you got it, you know, just the, the, the plane you got it with um, uh, IGAN. Uh, so we call uh, you got it with the IGAN cam as, as IGAN. Uh, you can see that. Uh, with you got it, uh, the damage is a little blurry, uh, whereas with, with IGAN, uh, it, it's more, um, it, it's sharper and it's also uh, uh, clearer. Uh, here's an, another example uh, which kind of illustrates the same thing. You can see you got it here, it's falling, uh, is generated here and it's a little blurry, uh, but the, the demarcation between spalling and the undamaged structure are a lot clearer. Um, here with the results from, from IGAN. We also have uh, a few quantitative comparisons. So here are uh, inception distances, uh, which is the difference between the distribution of the features extracted from uh, two sets of, uh, of images. Basically, if the inception distance, distances are lower, that means uh, you know, your, your images are more realistic. And you can see that for uh, for IGAN, um, two different inception distances, the kernel inception distance and the, the threshold inception distance are both lower than uh, uh, other GANs that we compared against. And then uh, also uh, another study we did was to augment uh, a classification neural network train um, with uh, like train to classify images as damaged or undamaged. Uh, we augmented uh, a, a real data set with synthetic data generated by ICAN. And we found that the performance of the network uh, improves significantly with the use of ICANN compared to, to other networks. Uh, and you can see that um, those results here, ICANN has a testing accuracy of 77.47%, which is higher than, than any of the other networks. So you know you can you can learn more about this at IWSHM. Sudan is going to be presenting this. Uh, at IWSSM uh, next uh, March. Uh, and to summarize this, this last part, uh, CCANs are a powerful method to generate synthetic imagery with more control. Uh, and the inclusion of class activation mapping in ICANN will help improve the performance for, for damage generation. Um, I, I'd like to, so with that, I, I come to the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank um, um, uh, my collaborators, uh, Bill Spencer, from UIUC and Yasutaka Narazaki from uh, uh, ZJUI in China. 
uh, and then also uh, my, my students for uh, for their contribution uh, to, to, to this. Um, and also thank you for everyone for, for listening. Perfect. Thank you very much, Vedus, for the very interesting presentation. Indeed, I mean, most of most of the research topics uh, are quite new for me. It's the first time I see them. This is why I was very, very happy to, to observe this, this new area, let's say, of SHM. Um, we have time for, uh, for questions. I will suggest either to raise your hands uh, or to, let's say, uh, write a question on chat, and then we, we can transfer that. Um, so yeah, are there any questions? I think I will ask the first question. The first question. Okay, Christian, um, go ahead. <laughs> thank you, thank you, very for this fantastic presentation. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, what I, I I was a little bit uh, asking myself about the <clears throat> the next step uh, you guys are training your uh, data set so it would uh, reflect a much i would say closer uh, profile of damage right but <clears throat> uh, how, how about the, the structural damage what are the the uh, paths that you guys are taking into assessing structural damage from this technique yeah um so uh, you know researchers have developed a uh, lot of methods for, um, you know, supervised learning to be able to, uh, if you have, you know, well labeled data sets, you know, to then figure out where the structural damage is occurring. Um, but um, I think that the main problem is that you don't have the ground truth for the overall damage state of the structure. Uh, you can you can figure out where, um, you know, there's local damage in an image. But to be able to combine all of that information from different uh, parts of the structure to make an assessment of, of the overall structure, that I think is still a, a big challenge. Uh, and so what I think is that with these physics-based graphics models, uh, also combined with um, you know, generative adversarial networks, we have a mechanism to model the whole system from end to end. So we, we can model the physics of the structure, and then we can see uh, what that might precipitate out like uh, as damage once you have different um, kinds of loading that's applied to that structure. And because of because we have that whole, uh, we have some means to simulate that whole process, uh, I think we're in a better position to build models that can uh, do what you just asked, which is to, to, to be able to make assessments of the structure using uh, you know, the visible uh, imagery that, that you acquire, uh, because you, know, you have some, some ground truth to it. I, I, I suppose I suppose that let's say this this whole framework can be easily adapted in regards to what you have available as an instrumentation. Let's say so. If you want to detect, let's say, a crack and the tower of the wind turbine, right? Then you can have the, the corresponding cameras that might give you, let's say, the, the the output that you that you realize. Is that correct? Yeah. So you 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 can have the cameras, but you can also have. Uh, you know, different. Uh, if you can incorporate different kinds of physics into your model, then you can see what kind of data acquisition strategies you might need for different kinds of cracks. Things and like and that. Can, you can accordingly adapt, let's say, your special yeah. scale from, uh, let's yes. say, some millimeters to even less or even more, right? Yes. And then also you can then make some relationship, uh, you know, make, you can make some model to figure out what, you know, how severe the damage is looking. Uh, by relating it back to your physics simulation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because say you have uh, a crack of a certain width uh, and you have you a number of those cracks, it's not easy to determine what the state of the structure is going to be based on that. Even if you extract that accurately, but if you can simulate the whole process, uh, then, then you know, you're, you're in a better position to, yeah. to make that connection. Actually, this this is one of my questions. I mean, regarding the physics-based, let's say, extraction of data, yeah. how how first of all, the first question that comes, I think, in all minds is how time-consuming is this process? What what kind of, of of computational resources do you require? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you can give us some some figures on that, because I, I suppose that it's quite quite heavy, right? 
Yeah, so so that's uh, you know that's the main uh, bottleneck. Uh, the is that right now at least what we've done we we've automated it, but just to to come up with the you know the scripts and there's a lot of software engineering that goes behind that, and then also there's a lot of uh, computational power that's required to be able to uh, actually run these these simulations. Um, mm -hmm. And um, uh, but you know with this framework. Once you know that that it works, then you can see which parts can be replaced with data-driven methods, and you can go on replacing those. And the advantage with data-driven methods is that they are uh, much faster once you've trained your models. Um, and so, then, you know, there's been a lot of work on physics-informed neural networks also uh, in the past, uh, you know, five years. So, so you know, incorporating uh, that body of work into something like this, I think, is still uh, an open problem. Yeah. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Then, then on the data-driven part, I mean, if if I if I got it correct, so you have let's say um, an image on the healthy state, let's say of of your of your structure to be monitored, and then you have a bunch of images, a database of images on damaged state of something irrelevant, irrelevant in the sense that not of the same building. So let's say. Yeah. And you try, I mean, is this some form of transfer learning actually? Um, it's, it's called unpaired image to image translation. Okay. Uh, so you're learning the distribution uh, between two sets of images and uh, the, the, the loss functions of the networks are constructed such that uh, it tries to keep, uh, you know, the geometric properties the same. And, okay. um, it sees whatever whatever is varying uh, apart from that, and then uh, creates a translation between that. So, so what we see also is that sometimes the paint color ends up changing, um, uh, and um, uh, so with the incorporation of the eigen um, eigen cam, uh, what we saw is that you know you know line like features like cracks and spalling, the borders of spalling, those are better uh, identified and they translate out better compared to just using the the plain version, and so so that's why um, uh, you know our, our, our proposed method works well for, for damage specifically. Uh, but yeah, it, it's basically learning to map the distributions between these two. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, ha I had an additional question that uh, I was going to uh, ask as a follow-up question. How how dependent is your methodology? I know it's probably very high right now from the final element uh, modeling. Uh, strategy that you are using. Are you guys looking into a different modeling uh, strategy, maybe, uh, you know, lumped uh, mass modeling or some other type of modeling that would reduce the dependency of, of the finite element, uh, in this case, uh, software? Yeah, so we have two models. Uh, we have a global model, which is just, uh, you know, a frame model. And we use that to get the interstory lifts. Um, and then also the um, the accelerations at each of the modes. Mm -hmm. And then we use that as input to the local components. And we, we make some assumptions to simplify it a bit because if you have a, a multi-story building with the same um, with the same layout in each floor, um, then uh, the, the damage patterns that emanate with the, with the same constitutive models, even if you have varying uh, intensities of ground shaking, they tend to be very similar. So instead of running it for all the floors, we run it for one of the floors. And then we use the interstory drift uh, to figure out what the extent of damage should be. And then we, we randomize it a little bit using some noise-based um, textures. I didn't go into the details, but you can find it in, in the paper. Um, uh, and then that way we're able to you know, generate some realistic living patterns. Okay, hey, that's very interesting, very clever. Perfect. So, uh, do we have any any other questions? Perhaps we are a little bit of time. I mean, a couple of minutes. So, um, yeah. If if there are no other questions, I would like to thank you, Edus, for for the very interesting presentation once more. It's it's a nice. I mean, this this is one of the aims of this project actually to interlink uh, new ideas on the field and uh, get in touch to each other. 
before I leave the floor to Christian to, to, to conclude this and perhaps uh, give an introduction to the next, the next uh, presentation, I just have a note that uh, the, 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 web, the web link might have a, a security issue. We will see that in the, in the, the let's say, in the next hours. Because when, when we press, somebody might get, a, let's say, a, a security issue and that blocks the, the access to the, to, the, to the site. We will see about that as soon as possible. And to that, Christian, I will give you the floor to, to conclude. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Vasilis. Uh, and thank you, Bedu, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Yes, we have been experiencing some issues with the website, but I believe that has been taken care of. I uh, recommend everyone to clear their history of uh, browsing and it should uh, you know, run smoothly. And if not, you can always contact us to the same email and we will look into it. Uh, it should uh, be uh, noteworthy to say that we have uh, all the security uh, features uh, you know, take in place for, for uh, this website to be safe. So no worries about that. I would uh, like to invite you guys to the to the next presentation that is going to occur uh, in 2022. So we're not going to have a presentation in December. We're going to have a presentation in early uh, January. It's going to be the 5th of January, 2022, at the same time, uh, 11 uh, Eastern time. Uh, the presentation is going to be uh, given by Dr. Saeed uh, Assam from the University of New Hampshire. Uh, and the title is going to be Mitigating the Influences of Operational Modeling Uncertainties in uh, Structural Health Monitoring. So it's going to be a very SHM focused uh, uh, talk. If you guys are interested, please check it out in the website, register if you have not done it yet, and uh, make sure that, uh, that you include uh, your, your email so we can send you a reminder uh, you know, shortly before the, the presentation. And, I would also like to give you a hint of what is coming in, in January as well. At the, at the end of January, we're going to have a presentation by Dr. Hei Young Na from Stanford University. And this is going to be focused in uh, using structures as, as sensors. So you are invited to register to these two talks that are you know, the upcoming January talks. And thank you so much for your time, for being here. And we look forward to see you in the future. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Vedus. Bye, everyone. Bye.